Sheriff. Can you tell us what happened this evening? We're not sure exactly what did happen, except I can tell you that uh, one portion of 6M, uh, a gun was smuggled into it from the outside through a window, and that one of my officers was shot. I don't know his condition now. We're going out to find out. Sheriff, is 6M a maximum security or minimum security? It's a maximum security section. How many people were up there? There was about uh, 56. And how many officers? Mm, I'd say about uh, 100. Were there any injuries other than your jailer? No injuries whatsoever other than the jailer. As the prisoners were being let out, one seemed to be in a semi-conscious condition. Is there a particular reason for that? I have no idea. Uh, what excuse did the prisoners give you for pulling this? And we haven't talked to them yet. We are trying to find out what did happen. What offenses the prisoners were being held for? Uh, any of them at all? Excuse me, gentlemen. I've got to go. problem uh, lies in overcrowding. Uh, hopefully the legislature, in, when it meets in Austin uh, in this coming January, uh, will enact legislation that will allow us to take those people who are under appeal and send them on to the Texas Department of Corrections because, after all, haven't they had their day in court? Uh, this is, uh, they've been judged by a jury of their peers, and uh, this is where they said that they needed to be. And keep hearing these bookmaking suspicion rumors and I'm, I'm getting to a point that I'd like for someone to stop talking about rumors and give me some evidence. Um, now it's indicated that uh, some people have gotten these rumors and uh, uh, there was even a rumor that some of my officers had been indicted by a grand jury and that's not true. Now it's clearly indicated in the in the uh, work that we've done with the FBI that there's no evidence available now that any of my officers have been involved in any payoffs with gamblers. And everyone keeps talking about that. Now I'm ready for you to stop talking unless you can come to me with evidence. And if there is evidence available, I'll look into it and I'll take appropriate action quickly and decisively. Mr. Rowe, would you tell us just what actually happened as far as you know? Well, we were sitting in the mental evaluation center on the fifth floor in the record building. And these about 10 or 12 men came out. One was tall, about six feet. 
six two, and uh, he asked for the keys to the elevator, and the nurse replied she didn't have the keys, and so he got very angry, and she picked up the phone to use it, and uh, he told her to put the phone down before she get hurt. Meantime, it was about 10 or 12, like I said, and they were squirming around in the uh, visiting area, and so uh, they said, uh, doesn't anyone move and you won't get hurt, so he told her to put the phone down, and... Uh, he went on looking for the keys, I guess, and then the phone ringed and she picked it up and uh, he said, put that phone down, you're going to get hurt. And she said, well, I have to answer the phone. And he said, no, you don't. And he jacked the receiver and jacked the phones out of the wall. And then one uh, yelled, the police are coming and they called him by name, but I don't remember his name. Well, uh, did you get a gun shot or anything? and we did in May of the intend to uh, make a decision on the replacement of Voters are turning out in record numbers in Fort Worth and Tarrant County as expected. About 285,000 will cast ballots before the polls close at 7 o'clock this evening, according to predictions by County Clerk Ed Lofton. Lines were long at many precinct polls even before they opened this morning. At Stripling Junior High School, Precinct 16, where I voted, about 45% of the registered voters had already exercised their right to vote before 12 noon. This precinct used the same lever machines that have been used in the past, but at Precinct 118 in Far West Fort Worth, punch cards were used for the very first time. The lines there were the longest that we encountered, even though there were 24 machines available. One of the machines broke down early, but that's the only problem that we encountered. Many of the voters were not too happy about the long wait, but we saw very few leave without voting first. The average wait was over one hour. Jim Green, Channel 8 News on the Move in Fort Worth. growth, but I don't think Fort Worth is nearly equal to what Arlington has done. Could we have a positive or no my evaluation of you? Okay, let me ask you this. You have now thrown leaders in this respect. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's well known is Project Pride. Educational nature. Uh, I doubt very seriously if we would have the world calls on us. In terms of making money, yes. Seven seasons out in Hamilton to come in and, and look into council procedures to see how that could be streamlined. And, and I think as time goes on and the necessity for more, I think it will take care of itself in that light. Uh, in the police department, as an example, not only are the cities cooperating. Is this, I'm a, uh, Has anybody found something otherwise? I think uh, she told me that you could add, I think I should be now. Yeah, yeah, I'll allow us for this, this is first person dual, we, you and I. A specified agreement, uh, the terms of which specify uh, which areas we will work in and what our program will be and where we will work. Do you have a guide when you go into these countries? Uh, do the students have someone that already knows the language that can help them with the people? 
Well, in any country where we have any substantial number of workers, we have an, we have an office set up and, an, and a base. Often in a country where we are working in a jungle area, we'll have a jungle base which handles the logistics and the supplies to the local area. When a person is getting ready to enter into a language area, uh, we always send someone along we call an allocator, someone who's had uh, experience and who has worked in an area, who knows how to make contacts. The This is Harris. Harris is a state. Okay. Statewide. Harris is statewide. Travis is Dallas and Tarrant County. How come they're not using a spot straight? No, I'm sorry, it was not this time. Yeah, I just wanted to, do you know that they do not have the uh, idea that they have? Set, so if you can be in here, it's fine. Like in front of the camera, below the camera list would be fine. Need a table. The story of Election Day 72 is told here at Precinct 309 in the Oak Lawn area of Dallas. That is, lines of people waiting to vote, even in the slow hours in the middle of the afternoon. They passed a record number of voters here at early afternoon for this particular precinct. And the same story is being told in precincts throughout Dallas County, and in fact in all of the urban areas of the state, apparently. There are 15 machines here for this precinct. They're all kept busy, even here at the slow hours. So I guess that it's really going to be something at 7 o'clock this evening. There probably will be long lines at this and other precincts when it's time to close the polls, and that will delay the count. As far as what we can expect, the latest polls that I've seen indicate that Dolph Briscoe should get about 58% of the vote, and that John Tower should get about 58% of the vote in the state of Texas. The same poll indicates that President Nixon may get 65% of the votes in the state. I guess all of that we'll have to wait and see about. There have been just a few problems with machines and all, but nothing that could not be corrected rather quickly. This is Roger McDonald, Channel 8 News on the Move in Dallas. Now here is Jim Green in Fort Worth. How long did you have to wait before you got to vote this morning? <laughs> About an hour and 15 minutes, I believe it was. Did you get tired waiting? I did. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any trouble with the punch card voting machine? No, I had a neighbor, a friend, who helped me show me how. <laughs> you like this, this system better I than do. the other? I, I do. I like, I like it very much. Who did you vote for? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now that's my business. The candidate of my choice. Yes, yeah, the candidate of my choice. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mixed it up. Good. <laughs> I felt like our offensive line played the best game of the season against the University of Texas. The quality of the opposition perhaps didn't. Uh, uh, make it that apparent, but actually in studying the game films, our offensive line did an excellent job of uh, getting off of the snap, maintaining and uh, sustaining their blocks longer than they had in the previous games, and I felt like our offensive backfield ran harder also. You find yourself in a similar position to last year, having just lost to Texas and a and having just upset Arkansas. Do you predict a similar result at the end of the week? <laughs> no, we had to have a different uh, 
change of the score from last year, but it is very similar uh, this year to last year's situation in that uh, Texas A&M upset Arkansas last year in Little Rock 17-9, to and this year upset the University of Arkansas at College Station. Uh, forgotten the score now, 10-7, to I guess. But uh, we had lost a heartbreaking game at the University of Texas 22-18 to last year. This year, we didn't lose a heartbreaking game. We lost a very hard-fought, uh, well-played football game 17-9. Uh, to So the situation from that standpoint is very, very similar. The difference is, though, that we have four victories this year, and our team realizes that if we could go on and win the remaining four games on our schedule, certainly we'd have an opportunity to receive an invitation to some type of bowl. Mayors Tom Vandergriff and Wes Wise were on hand this morning. Fort Worth was represented by Mayor Pro Tem Ted Peters. My partner and a very astute young lady was Kathy Pill, editor of the UTA newspaper, The Shorthorn. Arlington has always been depicted as the perfect city, as Jerry Taft just, you know, said. Um, but we all know that Arlington does have its problems. Can you yes. tell me uh, what is being done uh, about the poverty in Arlington, namely Track 222? And Arlington is far from the perfect city. There is no perfect city. There is no Camelot. But uh, I do believe that every city should want to strive toward being perfect. Uh, we all ought to be trying to reach a little bit beyond our grasp. And certainly I hope that uh, the story of Arlington's success, to whatever degree it's been, uh, is best uh, emphasized by simply saying that we're never satisfied with what we have in the way of a current lot. We're always trying to make things just a little bit better. As to what we learned in other areas, Mayor Vandergriff still thinks the Rangers will eventually learn how to win baseball games and therefore make money. Mayor Wes Wise has not yet decided whether to run for his job again, but he thinks the mayor of Dallas should make more money. And Mayor Peters feels that despite disagreement from Vandergriff, the earnings tax would be a good way for Fort Worth to make money. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News, reporting. It seems to start off on a winning note, and now the team seems to be kind of going the other way. You're losing instead of winning here the last several weeks. So what factor does that play now as you go into the a &M game? Well, actually, we, we have lost the last two weeks, but uh, the biggest reason is the quality of our opposition. Uh, Texas Tech and University of Texas both have uh, excellent football teams. They both have lost one football game, and without question, they both will go to a bowl game. And so... Our players are intelligent enough to know that if they play at their best and still lose to a team that's actually better than they are, I don't believe it dampens their spirit. I, I think that we realize that Texas A&M has an excellent football team. They have to have had to have defeated the University of Arkansas, but certainly our environment and our attitude is different from this time last year. The Summer Institute of Linguistics and the Wycliffe Bible Translators are building a new facility in Duncanville to train missionaries and college graduates in translating languages. If you don't know what linguistics is, 
Webster's Dictionary defines it as the study of human speech. Here on these 100-acre grounds, some 35 students are studying methods of translating the world's 2,500 unwritten languages. Dr. Frank Robbins is the director of the center. The lingu International Linguistic Center here, just being developed and the facilities now being built, is in its first semester of courses in basic descriptive linguistics, the purpose of which is to prepare students to confront an unwritten language. The Linguistic Center has contracted with the University of Texas at Arlington to train senior and graduate students. The center has set up two semesters of graduate level studies, plus six weeks orientation in the base country language and four months jungle training. Classes at the center right now are concentrating on the American Indian languages. This particular class is working on Choctaw. Dr. Robbins told me that there are some 50 unwritten Indian languages in the United States alone. Most of the translators are presently stationed in Mexico and New Guinea. The center uses the International Phonetic Alphabet to translate the 700 languages in the 23 countries where the Linguistic Center has translators stationed. Besides translating and recording unwritten languages, the center also spreads the Christian religion. After language has been studied and written, the Wycliffe Bible translators write the Holy Scriptures in the language of that particular tribe. The center receives no federal or state monies, and all funds are donated. The center, when completed, will cost about $3 million. For Channel 8 News on the Move, this is June Gray. Planning for tonight has gone as far back as the primary runoffs in June. Producer Jim Riddle has become as involved as a battlefield general in trying to make sure each segment falls into its particular spot, the whole thing, so that you'll be kept as up-to-date and as accurately informed about the 1972 elections as is humanly possible. To accomplish that job, Channel 8 tonight will have dozens of people here in our Studio A. Some will be chasing down results, others will be giving you results, and still others of the Channel 8 News team will be standing by for a special word from our own particular sources, word which we feel will allow us to keep you not only abreast of what's happening, but even a couple of steps ahead. As part of this coverage, we'll have live cameras in Wichita Falls, where Senator John Tower will be waiting out the election, and at the Dallas headquarters of his opponent, Barefoot Sanders. We'll have live cameras at the Fort Worth Press Club, where winners and losers alike will be gathering. We'll have a live camera at the Dallas Press Club, Democrat headquarters for the evening, and at the Holiday Inn Central, where Republican headquarters will be. Obviously, all this is a tremendous outlay in people and in money, but it's being done, of course, so that you, the voter, will know as quickly as possible how your voting is affecting the course of Dallas County, of Texas, and of the nation. We hope you'll join us throughout the evening for Channel 8 News election coverage. This is Phil Reynolds, Channel 8 News on the Move, in Studio A. And the superintendent is working with the Mr. John B. Clayton, surprising. The purpose of the report, certainly, is to analyze the help in that report. The movies and standard reporters had read and digested part of the movie. He said, Thank you. 
Well, actually, it was a, a very unusual game. We weren't really playing that well in the game to score 31 points in, in uh, three quarters. It was a lot what San Diego was doing early and giving us turnovers and field position, and it, we felt very comfortable at that particular uh, level. But the thing that happened to us was a hail started hitting, and uh, we found out that we weren't quite as ready as we were, we thought we were. And uh, when that happens to you, it's very hard to put out the fire. And we. Uh, had a lot of difficulty doing it, really, and uh, the only thing that was happening was that they were just starting to play football, and we hadn't been really playing that good of football the whole game. Coach, have you reached the point where you're you're really concerned about your defense now, having given up so many points in the last three games? Well, I think we're at the point in the season where we have to be concerned. Regardless, I'm not. I have a lot of confidence in our defensive team, the people who play back there, and I, I feel like they're going to come back strong, but you got to have it in the back of your mind when you give up as many points as we have in two or three games. Uh, we can't afford that. Uh, if we lose one now, we're in real trouble, and we just can't afford it. Coach, do you think the team plays better under pressure? You said that last year's success was due to the fact that you knew you had to win every game. Well, I think this team will play good under pressure. I think when they recognize the pressure is there, uh, then they'll play very well. And uh, right now, they haven't yet recognized that the pressure is there, and uh, sooner or later, we're going to have to do that. Uh, it'll be the first time in, in two or three years I've been in a stock car, and uh, uh, the first time I ever drove a stock car was interesting. It was at Daytona Beach in 1963, I guess it was. I drove for Smokey Eunuch down there and uh, had the good fortune of having one of the best cars in the field and uh, set a new track record and, and uh, closed course record for stock cars and uh, won one of the 100-mile qualifying heats. So that being the first time in a stock car, I've always kind of enjoyed stock car racing on super speedways. Uh, it's quite a departure from the Indianapolis car because uh, the Indy car is very agile and light, quick reacting, and uh, it's what I run the most and know the most about. And stock car racing is uh, a little different and uh, should be quite interesting for me. What, uh, interesting I guess in terms of what you're going to be driving, what are you going <laughs> to be in? <laughs> well, if that, as you say, is an interesting point. The car is, is fondly known around NASCAR circles as the rent a Ford. Uh, <laughs> a fellow by the name of Don Levy from uh, over in Virginia built the car. It uh, uh, has a very good record, a fantastic record, in as much as the car is made available to various promoters around the country at different tracks, uh, NASCAR tracks, to uh, uh, put in the local favorite or a top driver uh, to help promote the race and to bring people in or, or whatever. Philip Lewis is one of the three men who originally began the idea of planning progress only after consulting the environment. He's just completed a fantastically complicated study of Dallas County, working as a consultant to the city of Dallas to guide builders and how they'll affect the ecosystems of where they plan to build. And just as important, Lewis says the computerized maps will tell builders how the environment will affect them. For example, he told me, some kinds of soil hold water so well they crumble under heavy buildings. It takes hours to explain the significance of the study, but I asked Dr. Lewis to tell me as simply as he could what the study will do. Now, working here with the planning uh, department in Dallas, we're trying to store 34 some major natural system patterns in a computer so that we can begin to determine where all of these various patterns are located. Now, if we can identify that this pattern is most dangerous in terms of urban encroachment, we can begin to suggest that development should be located in this area. Well, adding up all of these various patterns, we've come up with a major overview of, the, of Dallas County showing that growth could occur here without encroaching upon the natural open space systems, the ecological features, without encroaching upon the outstanding soil or geological formations that would create these, these massive costs to society. So really what we're attempting to do is to identify 
on a countywide basis these important patterns as form determinants that guide the growth here rather than on these exceptional ecological systems or patterns that are a threat to the public. For the better part of the past summer, I have been periodically bombarded with reports that something spectacular was about to happen to the north end of downtown Fort Worth. People who just kept talking like they knew just kept dropping little tidbits of information, saying something big was going to happen here. I suppose you could call them rumors, but these people weren't the gossipy sort. And yet I just couldn't bring myself to believe that even as dynamic and progressive an organization as the Tandy Corporation would tear down a landmark like the Leonard's Complex to build a seven-block, 50-story skyscraping monolith. Thank you. Now, what can we do to help you? Well, I'm going to do a pretty good, but I was just like, you know, I'm not going to listen to the books throughout the whole process. In the fourth grade, arithmetic, let's take arithmetic. We have a chance. Oh, it's not of course, Tandy does own a significant portion of this end of town, the Leonard's complex and whatnot. So I conned and cajoled and entreated every source I could think of with every gadget in the bag of tricks. Among the things I cannot confirm is that the project will be completed within three years, that it will cost $70 million, that it will include everything from offices to an ice rink, and that the old Leonard subway will be extended two more blocks. Among the things that I have confirmed are that the project is well beyond the talking stage. Municipal officials in Fort Worth know about it. They've been sworn to a pledge of secrecy, which they are honoring to a man. The structure will contain a sizable new hotel, it will involve seven blocks of downtown Fort Worth Tandy property, and it will probably average closer to five than 50 stories in altitude. Tandy Corporation, of course, still isn't talking, but Fort Worth can reasonably expect some very exciting news on the subject in the very near future. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the Move, Fort Worth. Well, what we had hoped we would be successful doing and doing, Rosser, is in separating our nominees on a st state and local basis from the national and running them on their own merits. Uh, and rather than tying them with the national ticket, we got that national ticket hung around our neck and we just were not able to shake it uh, in all of the races. Uh, the, every time you would uh, get into any kind of a political gathering, uh, McGovern kept coming up. And that's different from the state statute that requires those participating in the primary to support the nominees of that primary. Now, the national ticket was not running in our primary, and therefore the statute didn't require them to support uh, the national nominee, but the McGovern rules did. Those rules uh, need to be changed before uh, next convention go around, uh, not because only of that pledge, but because of the uh, type rules we have, the percentage representation and permitting uh, someone like McGovern to be nominated who can't carry uh, more than one state. So over here we have the soil patterns, and uh, we've identified these various soil patterns, and then we'll transfer this into the grid system, and then we can store those critical patterns into a computer printout. What looks to be a not too similar area of ability. That's, 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 that's a good flip map. So we're trying to determine the patterns, where not to build, Here's another case. This is this is the whole region here, where we have underneath uh, Dallas the Trinity Sands. That's called an aquifer that has. Now 
where this formation comes out. Because of a smuggle lock full of weapons, a Dallas County jailer was shot last night in an abortive jailbreak. Someone late at night stuffed a small pocket knife and a small caliber pistol into a sock that was attached to a string. Then a prisoner upstairs knocked out a jail window and pulled the petty arsenal up into his cell. So as Deputy Arthur Pickering and another jailer were leading two inmates out of the maximum security cell on 6th floor, one of the prisoners pulled out the smuggled pistol. Both deputies lunged for the weapon. Pickering was gunned down and left bleeding in the cell block while 30 other prisoners swarmed into the hallways. Six tried to escape by the stairway as Sheriff Clarence Jones, leading a troop of deputies, stormed the jail and secured the building. The prisoners retreated back to their cell block and Pickering was taken to Parkland Hospital. He's in fair condition tonight. Seven of the would-be escapees were hustled into patrol cars and later arraigned on investigation of attempted escape, assault to murder, and six as ex-convicts carrying a pistol. Today, Sheriff Clarence Jones told me that although his deputies are trying to crack down on weapon smuggling, that's not the real problem with jailbreak. Majority of, them, of people? Uh, all of them, uh, but one, were on appeal that was involved in this last night. The sheriff says that with a total of 1,700 prisoners in both jails, you'd have to station shotgun guards at every cell to keep the prisoners from wanting to escape. But he says with less inmates for the jailers to worry about, the chances of violent jailbreaks would considerably decrease. Martha McIntyre, Channel 8 News on the Move.